Thank you. It is now time for question period. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier will note that uh, the galleries uh, are filling with people from York Region. They are seniors. They are people with disabilities. They're on their way in, and uh, they're being joined by a number uh, of personal support workers. These are seniors uh, who are receiving on-site 24-7 personal care through York Region's Alternative Community Living Program. My question to the Premier is this. The folks are listening. They would like to know from the Premier herself, why has the Ministry of Health disqualified the region of York from continuing to provide the essential alternative Question. community living services on which they depend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I welcome everyone to Queen's Park who is, uh, who is concerned about this issue because uh, we have made a commitment as government to ensuring that our seniors are getting the right care at the right place and in the right time period, Mr. Speaker. So that includes homemaking, it includes security checks and uh, care coordination. So, Mr. Speaker, here's my understanding of what has happened, and uh, I'm happy to have this discussion with the, uh, the member opposite. I understand that the region of York recently recently made a business decision not to provide assisted living services to both high-risk and low-risk seniors. However, the central local health integration network is ensuring that every patient currently receiving assisted living services will continue to do so. So, in fact, there, that care will be Answer. continuous, Mr. Speaker, although it's being uh, de delivered through, uh, through the local health integration network. So that's my understanding of what's happening, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier does not have a good understanding of what happened. These people did not make their way here today to hear the Premier tell them half-truths. It is disrespectful of the Premier to even a um, I I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. It is disrespectful, Speaker, of the Premier to even attempt to represent that what is a cut in service to seniors and people with disabilities is somehow the fault of York Region. Here is the truth. The truth is that the Ministry of Health pol Policy disqualified York Region from continuing to provide that service. And here is the result. Mohammed Asafuddin is 70 years old. He's blind. He, has a, he is a double leg amputee. He's a diabetic. Question. And he has recently undergone cancer treatment. His services are being cancelled. He is being asked to actually pay for additional services. Thank you. I want to ask the Premier, what's her response to that? Stop, stop, please. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, I think what is responsible is that people have all the information. And so uh, to scaremonger and to suggest that somehow service is not going to be provided is not appropriate, Mr. Speaker. So currently the patients of the Region of York's Assisted Community Living Program are being transferred to experienced providers who will be able to provide the enhanced Order. care offered through the new policy, Mr. Speaker. So as of April 1st, Provi the new providers will be offering 24 hours, seven day a week on site care at all the region of York buildings where this service was previously provided. So there is a change, Mr. Speaker. There is a change in the delivery. But to suggest that the care is not going to be provided is absolutely not accurate. And in fact, what is happening, Mr. Answer. Speaker, is that the care will be continued and will be enhanced. Thank you. Final supplement. Well, here is the accurate representation, and I'm sorry that the Premier has to read from her speaking notes that someone wrote for her that are inaccurate. Here are the facts. Last week, Chats told Mr. Asifuddin Order. that because he needs two people to help him with his lift and sling, he will Mr. have to Training pay College for the and University extra person the of Education to order. an hour. At the end of the day, it will cost this man $3,000 a month to have the same service he had before. And the lift that was provided under the previous service is being dismantled, and he will have to pay to have it reinstalled at a cost of more than $3,000. Wow. 
I'm going to ask the Premier this. Is that what she considers a continuation of service? Question. That is a disgrace. It is immoral. I will ask you now to stop it and to restore it. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, indeed, I was reading from the member for because I wanted Prince to make Edward sure Hastings I was giving accurate information, Mr. Speaker. We are ensuring that people who were receiving assisted living support will have that support continued, Mr. Speaker. I will absolutely have a conversation with the Minister of Health. I will talk to her about this issue to make sure that we have absolutely all the information. But, Mr. Speaker, we are in the business of increasing care to seniors. We are in the business of increasing care in the community, making sure that people get the supports that they need where they are living, Mr. Speaker, and in a timely way. That is the work that we are doing. Those are the investments that we have been making. If there are specific issues and specific cases that the member opposite would like to uh, bring us information on, we're happy to look into those. But we are providing that continuum of care. The region of York made a business decision. The local health integration is network is continuing that service, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Newmarket Aurora. Well, I want to follow through on this same question. And the reason is to the, to the Premier that the facts that she has don't be telling me the facts are wrong. Minister of I'm enough carping for you. I know exactly what the facts are. Please stop the clock. First, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure come to order. Second, direct your comments to me. Thank you. I'm happy to direct the comments to you, and I'm hoping the Premier is listening as well as her colleagues. The fact of the matter is, we are speaking here about people's lives. We're talking about the most vulnerable in our community. We're talking about seniors and people with disabilities who depend on these services to live a relatively independent life. This government is taking that away from them. I want the Premier to stand up and stop reading from your speaking notes and speak from the heart and tell us that you will do what needs to be done Question. to restore the ACL on-site independent service. Thank you. The uh, member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order. Second time. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I will uh, I will say to the member opposite that we are absolutely and fundamentally from committed to providing the services that seniors and people uh, with disabilities providing the services that they need and providing those services, Mr. Speaker, in a timely way and in their homes. So that means that there will be changes in the way services are delivered, Mr. Speaker. From Chatham, but to Essex, undermine to decisions made by the region of York, to undermine decisions made by the local health integration network, to undermine decisions made time. by the health providers in York region. Region, I don't think is responsible, Mr. Speaker. We are working with communities. We are funding increased from care Renfrew, come to, to make order. sure that seniors living in York Region and across the province get the care that they need in their homes, in the community, Answer. when they need it, Mr. Speaker. That's what our investments are about. And quite contrary to the party opposite, Mr. Lampton, Speaker, come to we order. are not going to slash those services. Can That's the policy of the party opposite. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I believe the Premier should undermine those decisions made by the Region of York, should undermine the decisions made by the Lynn, because those decisions are wrong. Those decisions undermine the quality of life of the seniors and people with disabilities in our, in our province. And it is the Premier's responsibility to show some leadership. Just because some other organization makes the wrong decisions, Minister of the Environment, that come to you order. should support them. And by doing so, what this Premier is saying to people in our province, to seniors, to people with disabilities, we don't respect what you've done for our province. What the Premier should be doing is standing up and saying, we will cancel whatever wrong decisions have been made, we'll make it right, we'll restore those services, well, and you should stand up and say that today. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. 
very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, it may be in the best interest of the member opposite to undermine decisions made by local bodies like the region, like the local health integration network. He may have his own Order. political reasons for wanting to do that, Mr. Speaker, but that's not how we function. What we want to do is we want to work with local authorities. We want to work with municipal Member from Leeds Grenville, come to order, second time. We want to work with local time. health integration Any networks supports. because those are the people on the ground who know the services that uh, are needed in their communities, Mr. Speaker. I care deeply about providing services to people in this province. I care deeply to making about making sure that seniors have the supports that they need, Mr. Speaker. They have earned them. They have made this province strong throughout their lives, and we have an obligation to make sure that they get the supports that they need. That is why we are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into their care and working with the local authorities to make sure they get the care that they need, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. The people in the galleries who are being affected by this wrong-headed decision are not giving an ovation to the Premier. The only people who are are the people who are trying to defend the indefensible. The fact of the matter is that wrong decisions have been made. There is time to fix it. We're appealing to the Premier to do exactly that. It is the ministry's policy that has directed the region to do what they're doing. It is the ministry's policy that has directed the Lins to do what they're doing. It is the Premier's responsibility to set that right. One more time, to the Premier, will you stand up and will you say that you will stand with these seniors and people with disabilities and you will set right what has been done wrong. You will restore those services to the people who are here who depend on those services for in their independence, for their safety and for their health. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the people in the, the gallery are Dufferin exactly County the people with whom I stand. And, and what I say to them is that we are working very hard that, to make sure that you get the support that you need. And I, I, I know that there may be a change happening. And what we are trying to do is to make sure that people get the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care Premier. that they need. There is a change that is being made, but our intention is Excuse me. Stop the I apologize for not catching this earlier. Direct your questions and comments and answers to me. New question. The leader of the third camp, the third party. Sir, uh, my question is to the premier. Yesterday, 162 families in Welland received devastating news that they'll be laid off as Energex 2 has decided to idle its operations. Like many families across this province, they'll be looking for work this spring and wondering whether or not they're going to find any. Over the past week, the Premier insisted that the Liberal status quo is working when it comes to jobs. What does she have to say to the families that have lost their jobs now in Welland this week? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, let, let me just say that it is, it's always a blow when, uh, when a company makes a decision and, uh, and there is job loss. And I, my heart goes out to the, the workers and their families, Mr. Speaker. But what I will say is that we will We'll do everything in our power to make sure that uh, those workers have the opportunity to make the transition uh, to a new employment, Mr. Speaker, to a new retraining. But Beyond that, Mr. Speaker, we are working with companies who are coming into the province. We are working with companies that are expanding their job uh, creation, Mr. Speaker, and that's the work that will make the economy stronger into the future. So we're not going to stop that work. We're going to continue that work because it's creating jobs, Mr. Speaker, Answer. including working with communities to invest in infrastructure. But my heart goes out to the people in this particular instance, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, there is no doubt that manufacturers are facing challenges all over North America, but the Premier's response ignores the problem and suggests that everything that they're doing over there is actually working. Instead of targeted approaches to help businesses that are hiring people or investing here in Ontario, she's defending loopholes and giveaways that hand, hand millions of dollars to companies that then outsource jobs. Instead of working to get electricity rates under control, she insists that sky-high salaries, bloated age 
agencies and subsidize electricity exports actually make sense. Does the Premier really think that her plans are working? Here. You know, we have created more than 400,000 net new jobs since uh, 2009, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 100,000 new jobs last year, Mr. Speaker. The member so from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to if order. If the leader of the third party, underneath her rhetoric, if what she's asking me is whether we're going to support the $2.5 billion scheme that she would like to bring forward, Mr. Speaker, the scheme that was adopted by President Barack Obama and then rejected by President Barack Obama because it wasn't working, the scheme that in many jurisdictions has been shown to not work and to actually spread money uh, in places where jobs were already being created in a very um, non-discriminatory way, Mr. Speaker. If she's asking if we would take that reckless path, no, we will not. We will continue to work with businesses, Answer. Mr. Speaker, to do that in a targeted and strategic way and to help them to expand and create the jobs that we know are the future of this province. Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, 300,000 manufacturing jobs have been lost in this province and have not been replaced, and the Premier well knows it. Families losing a paycheck this month deserve better from their government. Instead of a plan to help them with change that rewards yes, sir, training job colleges creation and, universities and cleans come to up order. the mess in our electricity system, they see a government that, once again, is focused on the challenges of the Liberal Party, scrambling to plug holes left by departing ministers and shoring up vulnerable MPPs. Why is this government more concerned about saving the jobs of MPPs from Oakville and Thunder Bay than thousands of Ontarians losing theirs. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I know the leader of the third party is pinning her hopes on her job creator tax credit scheme, but it's being discredited virtually right across North America. Barack Obama considered it, but he proposed a similar 10 percent tax credit. But in, at the end of the day, he dropped it because his experts were telling him that it wouldn't work, that it would be abused, as it has been in a number of states. It had practically no effect, according to the NPR editorial that they had on it. Uh, many, many people in Congress and the Senate said that they would, should be cautious about it because, it, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't work. Our finance minister, uh, ministry rather, has estimated that it would cost more than $2.5 billion a year. In fact, the Jobs and Prosperity Council rejected it, a Jobs and Prosperity Council that had Jim Stanford, the respected Answer. economist from, for Unifor, as part of that committee. I don't understand why they're pinning their hopes on a failed tax credit, which is a giveaway where evidence shows that 92 per cent of the Thank jobs you. would be created anyway. New question. For the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I can tell you that the status quo isn't working for hundreds of thousands of people that are underemployed and unemployed in the province of Ontario. My question is to the Premier. People in this province are also concerned that their tax dollars aren't being respected. They were told the original cost for security for the Pan Am Games was supposed to be $113 million, Speaker. Then the cost suddenly jumped to $239 million. My question is a simple one. Where's the accountability, Speaker? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the leader of the third party may know, um, the minister offered a technical briefing for uh, opposition members, and um, unfortunately, um, your member wasn't able to be there, Mr. Speaker, because it's very important that everyone who wants to ask a question about the uh, Pan Para Pan Games has all the information, has all the information about the procurement process that was gone through in terms of security, Mr. Speaker, has all the information about about the transportation costs and understands that it is our obligation to make sure that the security at the Pan Para Pan Games is the very best that it can be, Mr. Speaker, to protect all of the attendees, whether they're coaches, whether they're athletes, whether they are tourists, Mr. Speaker. People Answer. are going to be coming to the Pan Para Pan Games for this amazing event. We need to make sure that the security is Thank the you. best that it can be, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, after hearing about soaring costs, people are now learning that a U.S. firm with a history of violations and fines here in Ontario has been awarded the Pan Am Games security contract. Was the Premier aware of the history of violations and fines before this contract was awarded, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, I, I, again, um, 
um, had the uh, had the member had the leaders of the third party's uh, colleague been able to attend the technical briefing, she would have known that for this uh, for this process we were relying on the experts uh, of the OPP, Mr. Speaker. That it has been a process that has been led by the OPP, um, and I think uh, the I think, I think the OPP order. inspector Mike McDonald. I'm just going to quote him of the Integrated Security Unit, uh, Mike McDonald. He said. Quote, the government conducted a fair, open and transparent process overseen by the Office of the Fairness Commissioner. So, uh, and then Mike McDonald went on to say the contract was awarded to the firm with the strongest bid and demonstrated experience in large-scale security initiatives while meeting all the required private security parameters throughout the game. So, Mr. Speaker, we are putting our faith in the experts on this file because we must be assured that the security at the Pan Parapan Games is the best that it can be. Thank you. Final supplementary. What I asked the Premier about is, is she okay, and, how, and when did she know about the fact that this contract was being awarded to a company, an American company, that has a history of violations and fines here in Ontario? When did she know that that contract was being awarded? That was the question that I asked. In light of these re revelations, Speaker, will the Premier now do the right thing and call on the Auditor General to take a look at the Pan Am security contract? Mr. Speaker, all four members of the RFP Selection Committee for the Private Security Services for the 2015 Pan Parapan Games are members of the OPB and serve with the Integrated Security Unit. Mr. Speaker, I am not going to interfere in that process. I am not a security expert, Mr. Speaker, and I don't believe that the leader of the third party is a security expert, Mr. Speaker. We are going to leave that to the experts because we need to make sure that everyone who comes to the Pan Parapan Games is safe. Order. Yeah. Yeah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. And the member from Nepean Carleton. And the member from Prince Edward Hastings, which it actually could have been his warning. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Premier knows the Pan Am Games are a scandal under this current minister. Yeah. She requires him to report to her bi-weekly for lack of confidence, and, and she's allowed TO 2015 to create a new communications nanny position to mitigate the minister's ongoing blooper Why reel. Just Yet somehow, up? somehow the minister dodged a bullet with the latest cabinet shuffle. shuffle. Ah. When are the costs of retaining this minister too high, Premier? Premier, you just lectured the third party leader for it being, it's important to know all the details about the Pan Am Games. Why don't you tell taxpayers today, right now, what you're paying Neil Barton today? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I spoke yesterday about the reality that the human resources uh, hiring, the issues uh, uh, to do with human resources, are being handled by uh, Toronto 2015, Mr. Speaker. The federal government, the provincial government, municipal government, all working together, making those HR decisions, Mr. Speaker. We've had a conversation about the reality that this minister is providing technical briefings and opening up the process so that uh, the members across the way can ask all of the technical questions that they want and can have that information. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, this is a complex large games, Mr. Speaker. There are many moving parts. The, uh, the venues are spread around the region, Mr. Speaker, so that other communities uh, like Barrie and like uh, Hamilton and, and across the region will have an opportunity to have Answer. a legacy, Mr. Speaker, as a result of these games. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite takes the opportunity to get all the information from those technical Thank briefings. You. Supplementary. The budget I was happy to be in the technical briefings. Unfortunately, the, uh, Minister wasn't. Speaker, no doubt the Premier knows every decision through her bi weekly report, so pleading ignorance is seriously amateur hour. Let me help you out, Premier. Your Liberal friend, Neela Barton, is making more than you are. What? She's buying when you go to dinner, Premier, because this scandal hopper is netting between 250 and 300,000 taxpayer dollars. How do you get a job like that? All this, all this for Neela Barton, a Liberal staffer who's been there for eHealth. 
for McGinty and for Redford resignations, and now Pan Am. As a certain Premier, stance. you can save that money by just removing the source of the problem today. Now that you know the cost of Liberal cronyism, will you intervene immediately and replace the minister and Barton? Should have jumped up yesterday. You see your Thank you. Premier. Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. The Tourism, Culture and Sport is responsible for the fact that this member cannot day after day attack the game, but had committed on Monday. He said that the Para Pan American game should combine with the Pan Am game. So the member from Northumberland, the member for Northumberland, Quinty West, is warned, and the member for Barrie will come to order. Clearly, clearly, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. He suggests that para para athletes from all over the world. The uh, member for Barry will come to order. Second time. The member from Nepean and Carleton will come to order. Maybe third time. I'm not sure. But if you if you question my seriousness, keep going. Speaker, on a day where we will be hosting Paralympic athletes, he lacks Order. understanding to realize that Pala athletes are world-class competitors who should be celebrated. You seen it. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Carry on. Speaker, his comments are not only arrogant and ignorant, but aims to destroy Order please. Order please. Order, please. Last request. The member will withdraw. I was your speaker. He's come finish. Yeah. But aims to destroy the spirit of para athletes yeah. all over the world who compete in sport. He owes all para answer explanation for this terrible comment. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. <laughs> the, uh, the member from Glengarry Pre Prescott Russell, if you wouldn't mind getting into your seat so I can tell you to stop, but maybe I'll tell you to stop now. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, new question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Pan Am security contract just, just keeps getting worse. We're now learning that the U.S. firm, this government selected to provide security for the Pan Am Games, pled guilty to violating its license during the G20 summit and was fined $45,000 here in Ontario. Speaker, was the Premier or her minister aware of these violations, the guilty plea and the fine before this contract was awarded? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, let me just start by saying I'm very excited to be in my new role. I want to thank the, the, the Premier for giving me the opportunity to serve as Ontario's Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, I also very much look forward to working with my critics, the member from Leeds Grenville and the member from London West, so that we can work together and find ways to make our province even safer and secure for every single Ontarian. Speaker, I'm new on the file, so I'm learning all the, in the ins and outs, but I know one thing, Speaker, I know one thing for sure, and that is that our government is working in, 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 in developing and, and setting a world-class Pan Am, Pan American Games in 2015 right here in our province. 
These games are going to be hosting world-class athletes from, from, the, uh, from the Americas. They are going to be uh, welcoming Answer. tourists from around the world. And Speaker, we are going to work with our security experts to make sure that these games are one of the most secure games around the world. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, I'd like to thank the minister for no answer again. Speaker, how can this government have even considered a bid from a security firm that has broken laws in our province specific to the provisions of our security services? There's even a question, Speaker, about whose bid was lower and who had saved Ontarians' money. You, the company that you didn't pick was Ontarian. Speaker, can the Premier of, or the Minister explain why this government awarded the contract for the Pan Parapan Am security to a U.S. firm with a checkered security history that was charging more when there was qualified firms here in Ontario with clean track records? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, security. Speaker, security, is, uh, is a, security of games is a very serious issue, and we must rely on experts like the Ontario Provincial Police to make decisions as to uh, what's the best form and who is the best one to deliver security. Speaker, in matters of securities, armchair quarterbacks are not welcome. That's not what we want to be doing. That's why we have got an uh, integrated unit at the Ontario Provincial Police, which is responsible for contracting the security. They are responsible for all the details around the security. I will listen to their advice any single day than the, any member in this house from the government or from the opposition speaker. Let the OPP do their job and make sure that Pan Am, Paraman are games are Answer. the world-class games right here in the province of Ontario, Speaker. Thank you. Question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Uh, Minister, I've heard, uh, I've actually, Speaker, I've heard the Minister speaking about our government's record investments in public transit and the people of my riding of Vaughan have certainly taken notice. My constituents rely on GO trains and buses to get to and from work on a daily basis. They travel between school, friends, families, homes, and for a social evening uh, downtown uh, and also in my riding. Vaughan residents recognize the pub that public transit investments make transit a better choice for commuting. They reduce congestion on our roads and contribute to a better quality of life for all Ontario families, especially those in my riding. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please speak to the investments in my riding that were re recently announced when it comes to GO services? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's a great pleasure to rise, uh, and uh, I want to thank my friend from Vaughan, uh, the MPP for Vaughan, for his advocacy and his leadership uh, on, on transit. We, uh, as you may know, recently announced, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the extension of a morning and an afternoon train on the Barry Line, uh, and that we will be increasing that from 10 cars to 12 cars. That will add 320 uh, additional seats, uh, or if you want to look at it this way, taking three. 120 more cars off just on that one addition alone, Mr. Speaker. We will actually be adding two new weekly morning trains on the Barry Line from Maple to Union Station, which will create more capacity. This is in addition to a plethora of other investments we are making in different forms of transit and the subway, which is provoking great development right Answer. now in the Vaughan Cosmopolitan uh, Metropolitan Centre, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for his leadership, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for the update regarding the all-important Barry Go Line. This announcement is great news for my community, for the people of Vaughan. Increased Go service has long been necessary, and I'm delighted that our government is committed to taking these important steps. Speaker, I have also been, and residents in my community have also been troubled to hear about the plan or the lack thereof that's being suggested by the opposition and by the third party. Uh, the leader of the opposition has suggested that he would be making the kinds of investments that would directly and adversely impact the communities of Vaughan and those across York Region and elsewhere. My understanding is that his proposals would almost cease completely the infrastructure spending in communities outside of the Toronto core like mine. And from what I've seen, Speaker, the NDP has no plan at all when it comes to transit. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Transportation, can you please outline the investments Question. that our government is making in communities like Vaughan and across Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. We, we have at this point uh, 
invested uh, $9.1 billion in GO services alone. Uh, uh, we, and this is important, Mr. Speaker, because the investment that Metrolinx make have impacts all across the province. Uh, and my friend from Thunder Bay, Andrew Koken, the new Minister of Municipal Affairs, the cars are made there. The, for the member for Barrie, all the tunnels for the Eglinton Line are being made in Barrie, Ontario, Mr. Speaker. But it's also important to note we're the only party committed to 2 percent of GDP, which is 10 times as much as the opposition party. We're still trying to figure out where the third party is on infrastructure, because their, their history in government, Mr. Speaker, is to spend 10 cents on transit for every dollar that we, we spend. And, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't buy you a bus and barely fills a pothole, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you, you very much. New question. Member from Deposink. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, this morning I've got a large group of financial services people tuning in to carefully listen to your answer. They're not interested at this moment in what you have to say about the fall economic statement. What they're interested in is what you had to say last May during the budget announcement. Let's review. Last spring, you were told by the Ministry of Minister Finance of you were quote, not on track to meet the 2012 budget deficit targets. Quote. A few days later, you issued a news release the that stated, rural, quote, the, the government Affairs, is time. on track to meet deficit targets outlined in the 2012 budget. Premier, why did you tell the financial community, the bond rating agencies, this legislature Question. and the public one thing when you knew the complete opposite to be true? Please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member opposite seems to fail to understand that while recommendations and proposals and initiatives are put in place, while conditions change by market forces around the world, a leadership government must take action. And as a result of the actions we've taken, we reduced spending, Mr. Speaker. We took what initiatives necessary to recalibrate so that we could, in fact, stay on target. And the raw agencies and all the others and those that you make mention of, we do speak to as, as a result of those, uh, of those results. And as a consequence, Mr. Speaker, we're on track to balance our books by 2017-18, and we do so because of the actions that we've taken Thanks, to do so. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. To, uh, speaker, so Premier, conditions changed in a couple of days from when you were told one thing and said the other. You're not giving us the facts. You were told one thing, but you went out and told the public and this legislature the complete opposite. You've got a $4.5 billion gap, and you tell the bond rating folks all is well. This is like deja vu all over again. Last year, throughout the gas plant scandal, you told us the cancellation would cost $40 million, but it took the Auditor General to tell us what really happened. It was $1.1 billion. You deleted emails, and the OPP had to get called in. There's a pattern happening here, Premier. When you get caught, you delete, or in my case last week, you try to stop information from being made public. Instead of writing a jobs plan, you spend your time keeping the facts from getting out. Exactly what is it that you're hiding? Thank you. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite have had a history of hiding the facts. That is why there was a $5.6 billion hole in the budget when they were at last in power. We brought in forward measures of transparency and accountability to the point now where C.D. Howe Institute and others are saying that Ontario is one of the highest rated provinces and governments by way of transparency and disclosure and integrity in the numbers that we present. And as a result of that, we've become the leanest government in, uh, in Canada. We've uh, beaten our deficit targets year over year. We're continuing to do so, and we're investing in jobs, investing in the economy to create greater economic growth and more jobs, something that that party opposite is actually threatening. And as a result of what he's just mentioned, you, uh, months sir. old information that we had already exposed Remember and put out there for all to see and consume, we are taking actions to ensure that we balance the books, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to do so. Here, a new question, the member from Essex. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to first congratulate the uh, Minister on his recent appointment and wish him well. <clears throat> Speaker, the Minister had a uh, private member's bill that would require a 60 per cent Canadian content for transit vehicles purchased by municipalities. My first question to the minister is very simple. Will the minister introduce this bill as his first? Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought it back to the ministry because I would have ruled it out of order, but now that you've brought it back as to whether or not he will introduce certain legislation is fine, so I'll, I'll carry on. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, thank you very much for the question. I want to thank, uh, or the member, thank you very much for the question. As he's aware, as a minister, I'm not able to bring private members' bills forward, but what I can tell you on the specific issue is clearly this. Uh, we have made a strong commitment, and I would thank the member opposite from North Bay. Both of us, uh, in our previous lives and in previous times here in this legislature, introduced private members' legislation on this particular issue. I personally, as a Northern member, find it as very important. I think it's key to part of the revitalization of the forest industry, which has already begun to occur, I would suggest. We have some great news in northwestern Ontario, certainly in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacoka. This piece, I believe, would help that, but I will say paramount to us is the issues related to safety when it comes to this particular issue. We feel like we've done some pretty good work. The previous minister has done a tremendous amount of great work in terms of lining up that support to ensure that we're meeting all of our, our people and stakeholders who are interested in this issue. And on a go-forward basis, there's more I'll say Answer. in the supplementary, but there's, a, there's another important piece I feel it's uh, necessary to share with the member. Thank well you. Well done. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the minister knows how important Canadian content is in mass transit vehicles for Thunder Bay's Bombardier plant. He said, quote, the regulations called for in the proposed bill would help protect these jobs and encourage future growth in the mass transit sector. With his appointment as a minister, his private member's bill has now essentially died on the order table, order table and will not up, be up for debate tomorrow. Uh, my question is, will the minister commit today to making his bill for Canadian content in mass transit vehicles? a government bill and a government priority. Minister. The Speaker of the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Shame. We order, please. I'm just going to provide you with some, some feedback. This, this is why we type rope walk when we have these changes and things that have happened the way they have. The, the, the instruction I'm going to leave with you is to try to make sure that the question you ask of the ministry is directed to the ministry responsibilities. And I know that there was a little bit of weaving back and forth, both in the answer and in the question. So I'm glad that the minister has punted it to somebody who probably has the responsibility within the, his, his particular domain. And I'm, 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 uh, I'm I'm trying to offer some, uh, some guidance because it is a difficult matter and I appreciate the members what they want to say and do. I'm just offering all of us a reminder that when we do offer those kinds of questions, they're directed directly to the ministry's responsibility. And I thank you for that. Uh, and so I thank the minister for giving it to the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I, I too want to uh, uh, welcome my colleague uh, from Thunder Bay, Atacoke, to cabinet. And, uh, uh, I know the Premier is very, very well aware of, 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 of the new minister's views, and I'm sure that was weighed in her thinking uh, that Canadian content and the economic implications of our infrastructure investments are a priority for this government, Mr. Speaker. Um, so right now we have worked very effectively. The downside of being too protective is that we hurt Canadian companies competing in the large U.S. market. But right now, uh, you know, we go back seven years, uh, MPP, formerly MPP Morrow, uh, and previously as a city councillor uh, in his previous life, advocated. This has been a seven-year campaign that my colleague, uh, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, has been on. Yes, so I don't think it's going to disappear any time. This would be 1,200 jobs, but we will continue to work with the third party and in this legislature to realize the maximum benefit of all our infrastructure investments in each part of the Thank province. You. Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Scarborough, Rouge River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Here in Ontario, we should be proud that we have a ministry that is dedicated to providing children and youth with services and supports they need. In my community of Scarborough Rouge River, 
I meet families and vulnerable youth every day. They share stories of how the work of our government is helping to make their lives better. And Speaker, doing what we can to ensure the well-being of all children and youth in the province is not only important to us now, but it will define the quality of men and women who will live in Ontario in the future. Giving a child a boost and the supports they need will lead them in the right direction and provide them opportunities to make the right decisions in life. Speaker, an investment in our children and youth today is an investment in the province's future. Jim. Can the minister tell us on the work that the ministry is doing to support children and youth in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Rouge River for not only the question today, but his regular and ongoing advocacy for children and youth, not only in his riding, but across the province. Today, for everyone to know, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, and we'll be having a little celebration later and some cake. Everybody's invited to uh, join us later today. I'm proud that our government took the initiative to create this ministry and ensure that children and youth throughout the province are properly represented. As stated by our first minister, by focusing on positive results for kids from prenatal health through early adulthood, we have a unique opportunity to make a real difference in the lives of Ontario's young people. That statement remains valid today. Answer. Mr. Speaker, I've heard the party opposite would abolish the Ministry of Children and Youth Services. That would be a mistake. For the past 10 years, thanks to the Thank tireless you. work, we've made terrific Thank gains. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister is correct. It would be wrong to abolish this ministry despite calls from some members in this House. In Scarborough Rouge River, there has been a reduction in crime and gang activities since 2004. I personally attribute that to the actions of this government by providing children and youth better options and greater opportunity. From the increased supports for youth living in care or, or increased investments for special needs services or the many initiatives in the poverty reduction strategy, vulnerable children and youth in my community have greatly benefited from fo focused by a dedicated ministry. Speaker, the 10th anniversary of the creation of the Ministry of Children and Youth Services is a milestone we, shall, we should all celebrate. And as I said earlier, an investment in our children and youth today is an investment Question. in our province's future. The best way to justify this ministry to those who think it should be abolished is by reminding them of the major accomplishment made in the Thank past you. 10 years. Speaker, can the Thank minister you. tell us the Minister. Thank you, and again, thank you for the follow-up to that question. I can most certainly speak to the many accomplishments this ministry has had over the last 10 years because they have been many. We introduced the province's first-ever poverty reduction strategy with the Ontario Children's Benefit as its focal point. We transformed the child welfare system to make it sustainable and ensure that children in Ontario will be protected for generations to come. We've dramatically increased our support for Crown Ward, supporting the work of the Youth Leaving Care Working Group. We've introduced a new, a spe a new special needs strategy, a youth suicide prevention plan, a youth action plan, a new mental health strategy. And since we took action in 2003, the youth crime rate has fallen by 29%. Wow. This has been a very busy ministry. Building on our achievements, we will continue to help children and youth in Ontario reach their yes, full sir. potential. Thank you. New question. Member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Education Minister. Minister, I delivered yet another letter today asking you why you refuse to safeguard extracurricular activities for our students. You may have noticed that your teacher's collective bargaining bill sits in committee, stuck in clause by clause, and will stay there until you work up the courage to stand up for students. I remind you again that our only ask on behalf of parents in this entire piece of legislation is to ensure that co-curricular activities are not ripped away from students. Yet you continue to reject this outright. Is the threat of withdrawing support that the special interests hold over you, your head, so strong that you cannot risk politically incurring their wrath? Minister, you can run for election to lead a union, or you can be our Minister of Education, but you can't be both. Clean up your act, get your facts straight, and support the important amendments for students and parents across this province. Will you do that today, Minister? Thank you. Here, here. Sir, education. Yes, thank you very much. And, um, 
I, the answer is the same as it was last week. When I think about what happened during the Harris years, what I remember was legislation and regulation and attempts to uh, change funding and collective agreements in order to impose new rules of work without new compensation. In fact, they took a billion dollars out of school board funding. I also remember what we had during the Harris years was eight years of chaos. chaos. Kids didn't get extracurriculars. They didn't even get to go to school, Speaker, because people yes, were always on strike during their time. So, am I going to do what he suggests? No. Absolutely yep. not. Mr. Speaker, I'm still waiting to hear an answer why you could possibly reject this request outright. This is not a ploy or a tactic. This is not a game. Parents have been clear that they want their politicians to safeguard extracurricular activities come the fall. I want this too, but I cannot do this without your help. Minister, if this is about pride, Please, I ask you, let, up, let us put our egos aside and think about what really matters, the education of our students. <coughs> However, if this is about losing your political allies, please, I ask you, find the courage within yourself to stand up for what is right, rather than caving into the special interests at the expense of the student experience in the province. We know you were once on the side of parents. We know you can be again. Will you support this amendment and support Question. the students of this province for once? Minister, please stand up with us and help students yep. get the experience they need. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Minister of Education. I am absolutely on the side of parents and children and making sure. making sure that kids have extracurricular and I know from a lot of experience that the best way to do that is when everybody works together and I would like to point out that the Ontario Public School Boards Association the Ontario Catholic Trustees Association the French Public Trustees the English Catholic Trustees all want this legislation passed. The English, uh, the, the ETFO, the uh, English elementary teachers, the OSSTF, the English secondary teachers, OECTA, the English Catholic teachers, the, the IAFO, the Francophone teachers, they too want Answer. this legislation passed. We can all work together. It's you that can't work with anybody. Your question, the member from Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, today busloads of seniors and caregivers from the York regions are at Queen's Park. They are here because some of the most vulnerable people in the region community living programs are about to lose their round-the-clock care that they require. The government has been trying to put the blame on the York region, saying they cannot do much. Yet, the Minister of Health was able to extend this in-home care by a period of one month. Will the Premier tell the seniors and their caregivers who are here today if she's prepared to protect their health care services permanently? Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where the, uh, the blame has come from. I'm not blaming anyone, Mr. Speaker. What I'm saying is that my understanding is that the services that have been provided in one way, Mr. Speaker, are going to be provided in another way, that the region of York made a business decision that uh, they were going to get out of this particularly, particular delivery, Mr. Speaker, and that the local health, in, health integration, the central LIN, is going to be ensuring that every patient who currently receives service will continue to receive service, Mr. Speaker, and the reality is that not all seniors were receiving 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service, Mr. Speaker, and we want to ensure that that is in place, that they have access to that service as they need it, where they need it, and in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. So that's what the change is about. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, let, let me make it clear. When it comes to frail elderly seniors and people with disability, 24-7 coverage by caregivers, by PSW that know them, that know and understand their needs, 
is the gold standard. This is what they had. Speaker, I see it time and time again. The Liberal government can talk a good game when it comes to keeping frail, elderly, vulnerable people in their homes. They repeat, right care, right time, right places. But when cuts are being made to gold standard program that do just that, then start their talk start to sound like nothing more than empty words. I ask again, will the Premier going to protect these vital gold standard health care services Question. And, the senior, and the seniors that they support? So, Mr. Speaker, let me just, let me just repeat again. Um, currently, patients of the uh, Region of York's Assisted Community Living Program are being transferred to experienced providers because I agree with the member opposite that it is important for seniors to have, this, to have the care of experienced people who understand what their needs are because if, they're, if they are fragile, if they are in a, 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 a precarious situation, Mr. Speaker, they need to have that uh, trained person there. So they'll be transferred to experienced providers who will be able to provide this service, Mr. Speaker. As of April 1st, uh, new providers will be offering that 24 hour, seven day a week care on site at all of the Region of York buildings where this service was previously provided. That is what is to happen on April 1st, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. If there are questions about that, I will absolutely make sure that they get answered by uh, folks in the Ministry of Health. But that's what's happening, Mr. Speaker. Thank the you. care is being transferred. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, we know cities have many transit options, but in northern and rural areas, roads and bridges are what's important. We all take notice when we drive over potholes or can't get across a bridge in disrepair. Not, not only are roads and bridges vital to local communities, but they serve in important arteries to help Ontario's economy grow. Ontario's small and rural municipalities have infrastructure needs that differ greatly from the urban municipalities. And I want to be assured that this government has taken those needs into consideration. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please inform the House on what is being done to address the infrastructure concerns of rural municipalities? Mr. For rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for a very superb question this morning. We know that, uh, you know, if, if I uh, had the great privilege of being Minister of Affairs and uh, getting the opportunity to travel Ontario north, south, east, and west, and and meeting with my municipal colleagues, who I have a great relationship with as a, a former municipal councillor myself for, uh, for some 18 years. And we, when we brought forward that $100 million uh, infrastructure fund for small, rural, northern municipalities, I haven't seen such enthusiasm uh, in years when we announced that program at AMO and Roma, the opportunity to engage uh, with those fine elected officials that represent communities oh so well. And just recently, on my travel on Monday, uh, we announced uh, $1.5 million uh, rehabilitating a well in Hanover. Mayor Masco, wonderful lady, upgrading and, and upgrading sanitary sewer and old sound. Mayor you. Haswell. And uh, <coughs> I stand, you sit. Uh, no, no, I, I stand, you sit. Don't finish. Uh, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. I'm pleased to hear the Ontario government takes the needs of small and rural municipalities very seriously. Speaker, rural Ontarians have raised concerns over stable and predictable infrastructure funding. Having been involved as a consulting engineer for over 30 years at the community level, I know firsthand the importance of predictable funding. Rural communities need a full range of public infrastructure, from roads and bridges to water supply networks, to protect their quality of life and foster new economic development. With predictable funding, municipalities can budget efficiently and develop long-term repair plans for aging infrastructure, guaranteeing the maintenance of crit critical infrastructure for years to come. Can the minister update the House on what our government is, going, is doing to ensure municipalities have stable, Question. predictable funding for infrastructure? Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks, uh, thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I want to thank the member for Ottawa Orleans uh, for supplementary. And I'm sure, I'm sure he won't want a late show uh, later today because I'll, I'll provide a very full, a very full answer. Um, you know, uh, in, in rural Ontario, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been consulting widely, and I've had great discussions uh, uh, with the Premier, the Minister of Finance, my colleague, the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. 
And you know, we're hoping uh, to get a permanent program in the budget, uh, uh, whatever it's delivered in the weeks uh, weeks to come. I know there's great anticipation, and, and Minister Murray and I consulted with over 500 uh, municipal officials, one of the widest consultations ever in the province of Ontario, because we want to get that permanent structure right. In order to get it right, you listen to municipal leaders right across the province of Answer. Ontario, and we're waiting for the budget, because it'll be a good news day, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On January 29th of this year, it was announced that three teams were shortlisted to design, finance, and maintain the Milton District Hospital expansion project. These three firms are to be invited to respond to a request for proposals for the expansion project, whose start began in 2001 under a PC government. In 2002, I procured the land for the project, but after the McGuinty Liberals were elected in 2003, the expansion was cancelled. It was only during the 2007 election that the start process was begun anew from scratch. Then on August 25, 2011, another election year, the minister said this money has been allocated. It has gone through Treasury Board. Premier, your Minister of Health promised that the Milton Hospital would be expanded by 2016. When will the RFP be released? to the three approved consortiums. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Infrastructure is going to want to uh, speak to the specifics of this in the supplementary, but what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that it's very interesting that at the end of question period, we get questions that have to do with spending dollars, Mr. Speaker. At the beginning of question period from the Conservatives, all we hear about is what they are going to cut and what they are going to slash, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, when the leader, when when the leader of the opposition asks a question, it is always about cutting and slashing, cutting people out of uh, jobs, Mr. Speaker, not investing in infrastructure, not investing in building hospitals and schools, Mr. Speaker. So, our plan is and has been to make those necessary investments, Mr. Speaker. We have built hospitals, we have built schools, we have built roads, we have built transit. We are going to continue to build this province, Mr. Speaker. McGinty never got angry. Supplementary, please. Apparently, the Premier didn't hear the first part of the questions from, uh, from our party. Premier, the Milton has grown to three times the size that it was in eight, 1987. The town of Melton is one of the fastest growing municipalities in Ontario. Minister it is unacceptable that such a dynamic community as Milton should have the primary health care needs served by a hospital that has to be expanded to triple its size to serve the town. Under your government's watch, election time has become hospital funding announcement time in Ontario. As we near an election, I would like to ask you, on behalf of the people of Ontario, Premier, the RFP is ready to go. It's been ready to go for two months. Why is it not released? You're, here. You, You're playing me. politics with this issue. Thank you. Minister Order. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The, the member opposite is a most curious gentleman. I, 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 I have, and he has provoked great curiosity in me as the minister, Mr. Speaker, because for, for some reason, the member opposite voted against the expansion of that hospital. So I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit bewildered, Mr. Speaker, about the member's behavior, because he voted against it. Right now, Mr. Speaker, we have 12 hospitals under construction of 39 in which this government has now built. And the member opposite, as you know, supported a government that closed 28 hospitals. The, uh, the, the, the member from Halton will come to order. I'm, uh, I'm trying to speak here. The member from Halton will come to order, please, and the member from Burlington will come to order. Wrap up, please. 
Correct. So when you close 28 hospitals and you're criticizing a government that's 39, Mr. Spe that's building 39, Mr. Speaker, there is a word for it. Politics might be a polite word Answer. when you vote against your own hospital Thank and don't you. support it. There are some unparliamentary. Thank you. New question. The member from Timiskaming Cochrane. Okay, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Lack of winter road maintenance across Ontario has caused havoc on Ontario's highways for many winters. 76 people, 76 percent of people in the recent poll agreed. Even the minister has said that privatization of snow removal probably needs a rethink. In the meantime, in the meantime, contractors have been sounding alarm bells that funding for the ministry hasn't been issuing enough to clear the highways properly. So the ministry is issuing fines, yet the minister has refused to release the amount of the fines. So what's holding the ministry back? Release the amounts of the fines, where they're fined, when they're fined, and let's see, is it the contractors or is it the ministry who's responsible for a terrible snow removal? The Minister of Infrastructure Transportation. What's going Mr. on? Mr. Speaker, our greatest concern, and I'm sure that of our contractors, is the safety of our roads. And we work very carefully and closely with our contractors to maintain those high standards. Mr. Speaker, we added almost $10 million in Northern Ontario alone so those contractors could put 50 vehicles on. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is quite right. That money, that those pro those Contracts are now all outsourced out of the ideological zeal of a previous government that thought the private sector did everything better. Mr. Speaker, those standards have not changed. And Mr. Speaker, the member has read in the media, as I have, that there are penalties when, when contractors don't meet those standards, so we will not compromise the public safety, and we insist. That being said, Mr. Speaker, most Thank of our you. contractors are meeting those standards, and we look forward to working with them. Thank you. The member from Welland on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to rise on a point of order to clarify the question from the member from Essex. You stated that the question of the member from Essex should not have been directed to the Minister of Municipal Affairs, when in fact the private member's bill references a referenced places requirements on municipalities when purchasing mass transit vehicles, and I'd like to provide you with a copy of this bill for your reference. So um, I thank the member for the point of order, for, uh, and I will try to provide some clarity. The concern I was trying to express was that of a reference to a private member's bill to the minister, and that the ministry at that point, and anyone in cabinet, has the right to give it to the, mem the, the ministry that they require to get it to, to provide an answer. That said, it was a, uh, a judgment call that I made that I thought it might not be germane to the ministry. Um, I confess that uh, I was more concerned with the fact that it was a private member's bill that was being referenced and that it was not to be spoken to through cabinet because cabinet doesn't have any, ju uh, any jurisdiction over private member's bills. So I hope that's clearer than what I tried to talk about last time. There are no, uh, the member, the, I, I, I would like to, uh, get a moment without a heckle. No. The, uh, no, I'm in the right business. You're the ones that know how to do that. The, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. Earlier, Speaker, I neglected to uh, introduce uh, Yang Kong Kim, who is the Vice President of the Ontario Korean Businessmen's Association. <laughs> We welcome all of our guests. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.